our final speaker uh, of today's session is Casey Lally. She's a fisheries biologist out of the Baldwin office of Wisconsin DNR. And she's gonna be talking with us about a, some creel survey results from the Rush River of Northern Wisconsin. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about um, some of the results from our Rush River Angler Creel Survey um, that we did in 2020, 20, or 2021 um, in Pierce County, Wisconsin. So the Rush River is a pretty popular river within the area and probably across the Driftless area. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know the headwaters of this river begin near Baldwin, Wisconsin in southern St. Croix County. Um, the Rush is a tributary to the Mississippi River. It flows into Lake Pepin. Um, along the Rush River, we have six miles of public fishing easements located and scattered throughout the river. Um, and it's located in close, pro close proximity to the Twin Cities metro area, um, so within 50 miles of there. Um, it's a large, relatively large trout stream um, for uh, my management area, um, and it's definitely a fly fishing destination with um, some trophy potential um, within the river. You can see from the maps here, um, Rush River is located in the very upper part of the Driftless area um, in that St. Croix and Pierce County area. So the river covers about 32 miles um, of class one trout water and it's got six miles of class two um, brown trout water in Pierce or St. Croix County. Um, the class one portion is located entirely in um, Pierce County. Um, there's very high densities of brown trout um, with a lot of natural reproduction, especially in the Pierce County portion in the class one. Um, adult trout, trout densities are generally in the 95th or upper percentile um, compared to Wisconsin streams um, statewide, as well as compared to driftless area streams in Wisconsin. So on average, um, brown trout densities range from 3,000 to 5,000 fish per mile annually. Um, there hasn't been any stocking in the Rush River since 2006 um, because of an improvement in natural reproduction. And then shortly after um, stocking ceased, um, the Pierce County portion of the river was upgraded to from a class two to a class one status. Um, the current fishing regulation um, on the Rush River is a three fish bag limit um, with browns over 12 and brooks over eight inches. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna focus on brown trout. It's mainly a brown trout fishery. Brook trout are scattered throughout, but um, for this analysis, I'll just focus on brown trout. Um, so we were able to conduct a comprehensive electrofishing survey on the Rush River in 2021 um, that coincided with our Creel survey. Um, so we surveyed the Rush annually at our trend sites, um, but the 2021 survey um, surveyed the river much more comprehensively. So um, just to give you an idea of trout densities in the area that we did the Creel survey, um, I have trout per mile or catch per effort of trout um, by station. So the stations run um, from downstream or downstream most to upstream most. And the area in the red box is um, the area where we conducted the creel survey. So you can see trout densities are the highest um, throughout the river in the area where we conducted the creel survey. Um, and I should point out they, they range um, from a low of about 2,500 fish per mile to a high of 7,000 fish per mile. Um, this was in 2021. The Rush has always been a pretty popular river um, and a popular destination. Um, historically in the 50s and 60s, um, 20 to 40 anglers per mile were recorded um, on opening weekend. Um, anglers from across the country and even abroad have traveled to fish the Rush. Um, but after opening weekend, pressure generally dropped um, to fairly occasional use throughout the rest of the season. Um, we do have some historic creel surveys that were conducted in 1988 and 89, and then in 90, 1992 and 93. Um, so I'll be able to use um, the 1988 and 92 surveys um, to compare to this current survey, um, just because those were the most comprehensive surveys um, and they, the creel surveys were conducted throughout the entire fishing season, similar to what we did. 
So as far as the survey design, um, we basically replicated the Creel um, surveys that were done in those past surveys. So for this Creel survey, we um, limited our surveys to two one mile sections, um, sections or sites. Um, like I said, these were replicated from those um, historic surveys. And the first uppermost or upstream most site was located um, in and around the town of Martell. So Highway 63 runs right through the town of Martell, crosses the Rush River. So within Martell, there's about a one mile station. Um, of, there's a village park that provides public access as well as three bridge crossings and a fishing easement. Um, in El Paso, there are three bridge crossings that provide public access there. You can kind of see those zoomed in um, locations of our Creel survey and those um, in those maps that are popped out there. Um, so our creel survey ran for the entire length of the harvest season. Um, we did not survey during um, the early catch and release season. So our survey was from May 1st to October 15th. And in addition to um, those two one mile sections, we wanted to try to get a better idea of fishing pressure um, and effort um, throughout a larger section of the river. So we added some count sites vehicle count sites, um, a total of five. And you can see those tiny little purple dots um, on the map there. Um, so we have a pretty good coverage of the length of the river from Highway 63 at Martell all the way down to um, Highway 10. If you can see my mouse there below that little dot at 450th Avenue. So if anybody's familiar, um, these sites included Wonderland Road, Stonehammer, um, O'Galley Rush River, um, Fishing Club Land, o Ellsworth Rod and Gun Club Land along 70, Highway 72, and then down at Vino in the Valley. Um, so we conducted vehicle counts at these locations um, on one weekday that was randomly chosen and one weekend day um, per week um, that was also randomly chosen. So um, anglers were interviewed, quote unquote interviewed, and counted five days per week. Um, all weekend days and holidays were surveyed. Um, and then three weekdays each week were randomly chosen. Um, morning and afternoon shifts were randomly chosen. So there's a 50% chance of having a morning or an afternoon shift. And then, um, count times were selected during the day, and those were also randomly chosen to remove any bias. So to evaluate effort, um, we evaluated angler and vehicle counts um, that were conducted two times per day at both stations, both the Martel and El Paso station. And to evaluate um, catch and harvest, we used um, mail and postcards in place of in-person interviews. Um, so we placed these postcards on um, anglers' windshields um, and expected them to mail them back in. We included a pre-addressed envelope as well. Um, no in-person interviews were conducted like our normal Creel surveys um, because we were still under COVID restrictions during this time. So um, the maps on the right, you can see um, where our Creel survey stopped and started at each of these stations, which is equal to about one mile length for both of them. This is just an example of our mail and postcard um, that we gave to anglers and put on their windshields. So the far left is the normal angler interview questions um, that uh, basically was a requirement or we hoped people would fill out. Um, for the survey that just includes the normal questions that you would ask during a Creel survey. I also included an optional questionnaire on the second page um, where we um, asked anglers um, to voluntarily fill this out. And this was uh, more management based questions to gauge um, to gauge how anglers feel about local management of the trout streams in the area, um, how they view harvest, do they harvest, um, etc. I'm not going to get into that. Um, for this talk, just in interest of time, but if anybody has questions about that, feel free to get a hold of me after. Um, and we did post um, signs at both of our um, Creel survey sites, um, just notifying, notifying anglers that this survey was ongoing. So I'm gonna just jump right into the results. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about 
angler demographics from our survey. Um, total, we distributed 609 surveys. Um, 239 of those were returned for an overall return rate of 39% um, based on return rates from other creel surveys in the literature. Um, this was a pretty decent survey, so we could pre be pretty confident in our results. Um, so basically, this is pretty similar to the other two creel survey talks um, as far as demographics go. Um, the majority of anglers fishing the rush were male. Um, the majority of them were also older than 64 years old. Um, and you can see here um, in the red bars, the majority of our anglers fishing the rush were Minnesota residents. Um, this is kind of flip-flopped from previous creel surveys um, where Wisconsin residents were, um, were the majority and now um, are somewhat in the minority. Um, so you can see back in 1988, 76% of anglers were resident and 40% now um, are resident. So it's kind of flip-flopped from that. Um, many anglers are traveling greater than 50 miles to fish the Rush River. Um, likely because we're pulling um, all those anglers from the Twin Cities area um, and the, those people are traveling that far to fish the rush. So 73% um, of non-resident anglers traveled uh, farther than 50 miles to fish. Um, as far as effort um, for our Mar Martel and El Paso stations, um, there was a total of 6,539 hours for the entire fishing season. Um, there was much higher effort expended at Martell um, than El Paso, um, which was kind of interesting by almost 50%. So if you look at the table on the right, um, you can see that total effort was almost double at Martell than El Paso. And I'll get into some of the reasons um, why um, here in a bit. Um, there was a total of about 1,700 trips and anglers generally spent on average 3.9 hours fishing per trip. Um, there's a bunch of different ways uh, to look at that, 21.6 hours per mile per day. Um, but down here on the graph on the bottom right, um, I have effort by month. Um, and this is um, differentiated by the Martell and El Paso sites. So Martell is black and El Paso is the gray bars. And this is throughout the fishing season. So you can see most effort was expended in May. Um, and then the rest of it is fairly spread out throughout the rest of the fishing season. Um, so still looking at effort, the graph on the left is the percent of total effort um, by month. and um, the dash bars or the dash diagonal bars are from the 1988 creel survey. The gray is 1992. And then the most recent are the creel survey um, from 2021 is black bars. Um, so you can see fairly similar. However, in the previous surveys in 1988, much more effort was expended in the month of May. Um, and then very little effort throughout the rest of the fishing season, whereas 2021, May still has the most effort, but effort is um, fairly more spread out throughout the course of the rest of the season. Um, as far as the angler density, um, if we look at angler hours per mile per day, um, so what you might see on a given stretch of river on a given day um, throughout the fishing season. Um, so I've got two comparisons here for the rush. Um, the rush, uh, rush river, in the orange bar, um, if you look at angler density, um, so angler hours per mile per day, um, in just Martell and El Paso, that two mile section, angler density is extremely high, um, way higher than any of the other um, trout, streams, trout streams that I have compared here, um, including the Wisconsin trout streams median and the 75th percentile for Wisconsin trout streams effort and also the Brule River. Um, but since that was only covering um, a, two, a small two mile section, um, it kind of inflates our estimates of this and it's not really comparing apples to apples. So if you look at the gray bar, um, which includes the Rush River, um, 
throughout an 18 mile section. So like I mentioned earlier on that map um, from Highway 63 down to Highway 10, we did those extra vehicle counts. Um, so we pretty much covered that section of river um, as far as angler effort. So if you look at angler effort throughout that 18 mile section, which is much more comparable to these other streams um, that encompassed almost the entire rivers that they were looking at, um, it's much more comparable. So we're in like the the median or the 50th percentile um, for angler density on the Rush River if you look at that entire 18 mile section. So looking, kind of looking at total angler effort a little bit differently um, from these two pins on the map here represent um, that entire 18 mile section that we estimated effort for. So if you look at angler hours on the Rush River compared to some other trout streams like the White River in Bayfield County or the Brule River, um, angler effort within that 18 mile section, this is total effort. Um, um, was just just came in second to the Brule River, basically. Um, so it's well above that third quartile or the 75th percentile for effort expended on trout streams statewide. So there's a lot of effort going um, into fishing the rush, super popular river. Um, now moving on to catch, um, a total of 1,600, around 1,600 trout were caught during that, during the 2021 fishing season um, during our creel survey. Um, higher catch rates in El Paso, um, 1.4 fish, fish per hour versus Martell at 1.03 fish per hour. Um, that kind of lines up with trout densities in both of those areas. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, El Paso contains almost double, um, double the amount of trout that the Martell um, site does. Um, total projected catch was about 8,500 8, brown trout in total throughout the entire fishing season. Um, so if you look at projected catch, it basically matches up with effort. Um, so that top graph, um, most brown trout were caught in the month of May, um, and then the rest is spread out through, uh, throughout the rest of the fishing season. Um, looking at the bottom table, um, you can see how this compares um, from the 1988 creel survey. So pretty similar catch rates from 1988 and um, total catch as well. So not much has changed as far as catch. If you look at harvest, um, on the flip side, while people were catching quite a bit of quite a few trout, harvest um, is next to nothing. So extremely low harvest, only 51 trout were harvested during our creel survey, which resulted in 0 0.0 fish or 0 0.04 brown trout per hour being caught or being kept. Um, this resulted in projected harvest throughout the entire season of 130 brown trout being kept. Um, there wasn't any difference. Um, between harvest rates of non-resident and resident anglers. Um, and you can see from the graph um, on the far right-hand side in the corner, um, harvest has pretty drastically declined um, from 1988. So average daily harvest in 1988 was about 0.3 fish per hour, which doesn't seem like much, but now it's an average of 0 .0 fish per, 0.04 fish per hour or one fish for every 50 hours spent fishing is harvested. Um, reported lengths of fish harvested, um, the average length that people kept was um, about 13 and a half inches. Um, it ranged from 10 to 17 inches. So people actually reported that they kept fish below the minimum length limit, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, and if you look at um, harvest throughout the fishing season in the um, corner graph, um, this is harvest by month. So you can see it matches up with effort and catch rates. The highest harvest was in May, followed by June, and then not much throughout the rest of the summer into October. Um, looking at gear types um, the anglers used. So we have these five categories. Um, looking at the left graph first, this is percent um, percent of each gear used by anglers. Um, you can see that flies were by far the most popular gear type to be used, followed by spinners and worms, um, or yeah, spinners and worms, very few people using minnows or crankbaits. Um, but if you look at the graph on the right, this is the number of trout caught per trip. So basically how effective 
um, was each gear. Um, and you can see that crankbaits were by far the most effective gear, catching an average of eight and a half trout per trip. Um, and that's followed up by flies um, and then um, spinners, minnows, and worms split pretty evenly as far as the number of trout caught per trip by those gear types. So to summarize all of this, um, we had pretty similar demographics to the previous creel survey, creel surveys on the rush from 1988-1992. Um, the majority of English were male over the um, age of 64, um, and English are still traveling really long distances to fish the rush. Um, 40 percent or sorry 40 higher percentage of Minnesota anglers during this creel survey compared to the previous creel surveys in which Wisconsin residents made up the majority of anglers um, but like I mentioned the Rush River is only 40 minutes um, to the Twin Cities um, and the local T TU chapters that I work pretty closely with are largely made up of Minnesota residents um, Several anglers um, did state to the Creole clerk um, and on our um, survey that they turned in that um, a lot of them traveled to fish the rush because of the wild and scenic feel of the river and the ability to um, basically get away from other anglers. Um, and there's also several class one and class two trout streams that are in very close proximity. Um, so there's tons of options um, for trout fishing in the immediate area. We also saw an increase in angler effort, um, a pretty substantial increase by 80% and 65% from those previous two creel surveys. Um, this was due um, to an increase in trip length. So once people go fishing, they're spending a lot longer um, period of time um, on their fishing trip than in the past. Um, and the number of trips that anglers um, are completing um, is also much higher. Um, basically, there's a much higher focus on catch and release um, instead of um, anglers getting their limits, um, like in the past, um, with the goal um, or focus on harvesting. Um, once folks would reach their limits, um, they would head out, um, likely thus leading to um, the shorter trip length um, from previous creel surveys. So pressure is much more evenly spread out um, during the course of the fishing season relative to past surveys. Um, I know during the past um, two surveys, the early catch and release season wasn't present. Um, so it was just the harvest season. And in addition to that, something, um, another thing that might, that's likely causing this more spread out fishing pressure throughout the season, um, the rush has undergone very drastic changes um, from the 80s and 90s till now. Um, it's gone from um, a very low density brown trout and stocked rainbow trout fishery um, in the past. So yearling rainbows were stocked prior to opening day um, in 1988. Um, and this is basically transitioned to a totally self-sustaining, naturally reproducing brown trout fishery. Um, like I mentioned earlier with that change um, to the class one status in 2013. Um, and now we have a very high density naturally producing brown trout fishery. So that change in the fishery from the stocked rainbows going into opening day, um, you know, with folks anticipating opening day and, um, and getting out there and getting their limits on those um, stocked rainbow or stocked brown trout. And now we have um, this very high quality, high, high density brown trout fishery now. So the rush has extremely high angler effort. It's a very popular river. Um, the amount of angler effort expended on the rush is well above the 75th percentile for stream statewide. Um, the trip length, average trip length on the rush compared to the statewide average um, is 3.9 hours um, spent fishing the rush per trip. Um, compared to 2.7 hours um, statewide. So when people fish the rush, they're spending um, a lot of time out there. Um, and basically angler density is very, very high as you saw from the comparisons. Um, so total effort is over three times higher than the Wisconsin trout streams, um, upper third coil trial, and um, comes in second to the Brule River. So along with high, um, high effort, um, there was higher catch rates in, in El Paso um, compared to Martel. Um, 
However, Martell is um, the most popular fishing spot on the Rush River. Um, it had almost double the amount of effort compared to El Paso, um, but with the higher catch rates in El Paso, that basically um, mimics what we find in our in our trout stream electrofishing surveys. Um, trout densities are basically double um, at Martell than what they are or double what they are in El Paso is what they are in Martell. So um, much higher trout density in El Paso, likely leading to those um, differences in catch rates there. Um, there's also a much higher um, angler um, har or angler catch rates compared to historic surveys in 2021. Um, so there's been an increase by 37% from 1988 and 101% from 1992. Um, like I said, there's just been this extreme change in the fishery from 1988 to current conditions. Um, with that stocked rainbow and brown trout fishery, now we have this naturally producing brown trout population. Um, so catch rates were one fish per um, per 1.3 hours, um, a little bit lower than the West Fork of the Kickapoo that Kirk just talked about a little bit ago, um, but still um, pretty decent catch rates. On the other hand, harvest rates were extremely low. Um, extreme decline in harvest by 73% from that 88 survey. Um, similar to what um, Kirk mentioned on the West Fork of the Kickapoo, um, with about one fish harvested per 167 hours by fishing. Um, so basically, um, in the Rush River, um, there's a little bit of poor size structure of brown trout, and this there could definitely be um, room for improvement um, on the size structure of brown trout if harvest um, within the river, angler harvest within the river was higher. So from this data and from um, our trout stream electrofishing data that we completed in 2021, um, we can infer some management implications. Um, so we've got very low angler harvest coupled with high densities of small brown trout annually. Um, I've just got a length frequency here. Um, so this is the number of fish in each length group and you can see the majority of fish are in that six to 11 inch range. Um, and this occurs annually. So 85 to 90% of the fish are in this length range. Um, so basically current fishing regulations aren't appropriate for the current fishery. Um, the goal with the Rush River is basically to manage for quality trout um, with moderately high densities. We have very, very high densities now, um, very high recruitment and um, very high natural reproduction and recruitment, um, basically on an annual basis, which is why we have these very high densities of small fish. So basically with this, with our current regulation of the 12 inch minimum, it's not really appropriate anymore if we want to manage for a more quality size fishery and improved size structure because this regulation is protecting the majority of fish from harvest um, and um, not necessarily causing, I shouldn't put that word in there, but um, contributing to a stacking up of fish under the length limit, um, which impacts growth rates and condition of fish. Um, um, so it's basically experiencing density dependence here. So with the majority of fish um, in that 6 to 11 inch range annually, um, this regulation is no longer appropriate if we want to try to focus or encourage harvest of their small, those smaller fish um, to help to thin them out to improve growth rates and condition of fish and hopefully improve the size structure. Um, however, this um, any change in the regulation would only um, show improvements or contribute to a better size structure if harvest is high enough. Um, so basically regulations are ineffective um, if there's no harvest. So we're working um, currently to try to promote harvest in some of these streams with very high densities of trout. Um, and just letting anglers know that um, harvesting trout is not always um, not always a bad thing or won't um, contribute to a poorer fishery. So here, um, harvest can only help. And with that, I can take any questions. We had a couple of questions come through. 
Uh, one asking, how do you incorporate the non-angler or non-consumptive use of this sectional river into your management decision-making process? I guess you just kind of touched on that. I think that one came in uh, before yeah. you get to that section. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, like I said, if if nobody's keeping fish, our, our fishing regulations are ineffective, basically, and it's tough. So yeah, like I said in that last slide, we're, we're trying to do um, more outreach. Um, and publishing articles just letting people know um here you know if you that if you harvest fish or decide to harvest fish um it's not going to be negatively impacting the fishery especially if you're following the regulation so yeah it's something that we're working on um you know to change people's outlooks um on trout harvest basically yeah there's um there's a related question that came in looking to see if DNR or TU have Rush River goals for angler use or for um, for the demographics. Do you have any to share from DNR? Um, as far as like, I guess, improving demographics or. Um, I think that's what they're getting at, maybe. Um, okay. I don't you know, total amount of pressure or to see the demographics shift somewhat. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, like I said, you know, most of our anglers were male, similar to these other um, other creel surveys that we heard this morning. Um, and the majority of anglers fishing the rush are over 64 years of, years of age. So um, there's definitely, I know TU is fo focusing on, you know, my local chapters anyways, focusing on um, getting more women involved in fishing. Um, and fly fishing and as well as uh getting some younger folks um out there on the water as well so i know there's a push for that um i'm sorry what was the rest of that question maybe i should read those too let's see yeah this one was from mike engel at fish and wildlife service um yeah so with the pressure um and the the amount of anglers fishing the rush um Basically, I mean, there's a lot of other trout streams in the area. Um, we've been trying to do um, more access related work. So we are mowing um, different sections of streams to try to make access easier, just to try to spread anglers out or allow anglers to spread out a little bit more. Um, we are still um, constantly trying to purchase easements on the Rush River and other streams nearby. Um, and we're doing a lot of habitat work um, on nearby streams like the Trimbell and Plum Creek, um, which also helps to to spread anglers out and um, might help um, minimize um, angler angler pressure on the Rush River if um, overcrowding becomes an issue. Basically, um, Teresa Shea had one asking about the draw to El Paso. If you think it's the better access or more amenities in town, um, what might be driving that higher? <laughs> yeah, well, so yeah, so we saw um, um, the most anglers and the most angler or effort expended was at the Martell site. Um, and there, for sure, there's a town park that makes access really, really easy. Um, there's an easement within our site there. Um, and it's and it's very visible. It's right along Highway 63. So that's mm -hmm. definitely um, contributing to the amount of pressure there. Um, El Paso, um, it's pretty well known site. Um, and there's still a lot of access there. It's a little harder to get to the stream. Um, but El Paso, the trout densities there are much higher um, than Martell and upstream from there. And I think um, the word is out and basically, you know, people know, and that's, that's basically the go-to fishing spot. So the, the Martell and El Paso site, um, even comparing angler effort um, among our additional five sites that we counted anglers at, it was, they were by far um, the most popular sites even compared to those other ones. So um, mm -hmm. definitely the access um, is contributing to that. Yeah. Um. There's one only you can answer. Um, someone was looking for more information on what your upstream most station was. I don't know if you are able to go back on your slides to the one that showed the station numbers. Yeah. Um, they were looking at the, a bar graph showing the number oh, of stations. Um, was it this one, the trout oh, per mile maybe? I think so, because it okay. says the lowest number was 
number two. Is that the upstream most station then? That's actually the downstream most station. Um, so that's down by like um, Maiden Rock Highway 35. So um, downstream of Highway 10, the river changes a little bit. Um, it turns to a little bit more cool water, warm water transition. Um, there's still trout down there, obviously, um, but densities are very low. Um, there's a bit, much better higher or much better size structure of fish down there. So if you um, likely are fishing down there, you're you have a good chance of catching um, a quality or trophy size fish in that area. Um, but the thermals are much poorer down there and the forage base is much wider. So that's why we see a lower trout density, but higher mm -hmm. size structure. Okay. Did you, I guess here's, here's one. Um, is there information on how an increased harvest would also benefit the brook trout fishery? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it could potentially, it would take a lot of brown trout harvest um, um, to improve or, you know, to allow the brook trout population to increase. Um, but there are there are brook trout throughout the rush. Um, they're mostly concentrated where small tributaries come in, um, but they'll use the main stem um, for, you know, summer and overwintering habitat, and they'll use the small tributaries to spawn as nursery habitat. So we do see brook trout throughout, but, um, you know, the rush is, it's been a brown trout stream, um, you know, for decades, and it would take, you know, a significant amount of harvest to reduce densities um, to where we would probably see a response from brook trout, but um, the definitely the tributaries will continue um, to likely hold those brook trout. Like Kirk mentioned, um, we have the trout tool um, on the DNR's website. If you if folks just search for the word trout, that'll pop up and that shows um, pretty much all of our easements except the very new ones, um, where those are located. And it also shows where Habitat Works located. Um, but if people have questions um, or want a more detailed map, um, you can for sure get a hold of me. But they would go to the dnr.wi.gov. To... Yep. And, and look for access map. Yeah, I would search for the trout tool. On trout the tool, website. thank you. Yep, yeah. Thank you. Casey, we'll, we'll let you off the hook. There are a few more questions, I think, in the Q&A if you wanted to take a peek and see if there's um, anything else that you might be able to answer in there. For sure, sounds good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Casey.